people, we wanna get out there and market ourselves and be discovered. God doesn't need to discover you, He created you. He already knows who you are. You don't need to be discovered by God because you've been created by God. But a lot of us are out there marketing ourselves, trying to be discovered and God's saying, I don't need you to be discovered, I need you to be formed and I need you to be transformed into my image so you could do what I put you on the earth to do. And we've got too many of us running out there, trying to be discovered rather than allowing God to develop us. There are over uh, 400 million pictures uploaded on Instagram, on, on Facebook actually, every day. Over 200 million on Instagram. And yet, not that long ago, I'm certainly alive long enough to know that was not even possible, but we live in this snap and upload generation. It's just the way that it is. I mean, I'm, I love it. Anyone that follows me, you know, I, I absolutely love it. And so everywhere I am, I put it up there and off it happens. Now, there are some great pros with that, like the fact that I could be talking about what's happening at the conference and Australia sees that. But there are also some cons with that because a generation has been raised up in a snap and upload generation, they can often think that that's how everything is. It's instant and it's quick. I mean, if I, if I want a, a booking at a restaurant nowadays, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna go and call anyone. I'm just gonna go on open table. I'm not gonna line up to buy tickets to anything. I'm just gonna book online. I mean, we just do everything online and we want it instant. I mean, you know, if we wanna talk to each other, we text and, do you know how many friendships have broken up over bubbles on a text message? It's like you are texting someone and then you see the bubbles and so you know they're ready to answer you back and then it just goes silent. <laughs> and I've watched people manifest and I've watched people freak out and it's worse if the friend next to them gets a text from the person that just didn't text you back after you got bubbles and people are like freaking out. Well, I remember when I was growing up, we thought it was radical when this camera was invented. Does anybody remember that church? Anybody? I mean, we thought, let me just see how to work this one. It goes off, on. I mean, literally we would go in and we thought this was fantastic. You go, look, this is, which is the best looking section? Are you the best looking section? Yeah. Any single people in this section? Yeah. And I mean, we just could not believe that you could do this and that this thing, you just had to wait for about six minutes. We thought that was radical. My daughters are like, Mom, I could have uploaded 400 pictures by now and had 7,000 likes and a whole lot of comments and, and you're still just waiting. I don't, I'm too scared to pull it because I don't know how to work this one. But <laughs> It's like, we're still waiting. But what I thought was really quick, my kids think there is no way. There is no way, Mum, we're going back to that. They're a bit trendy now. They've had a bit of a, you know, they come back like vinyl records, but it's just really for show. And so everyone is uploading through their Facebook. They're uploading through their Instagram. And we're just still waiting, still waiting for this image to be forged. Well, because I'm even older than a Polaroid camera, I want you to know I grew up in the dark ages when we had a thing called, oh yeah. Now, some of you don't know what this is. This is an ancient relic. It's been dug up from an uh, excavation site in Australia. And this, this is called 35 millimetre film. And back in my day, you had to take one of these and you had to put it in this thing, separate thing that was not also a phone or a clock or an entertainment device. It was just a camera. That's all it was. You couldn't talk in the camera and say, hey Siri, while I'm taking a picture, how do I feel about the weather today in Austin? You couldn't do that because you just put this in. And then you put this roll of film in, you took your pictures, then you took the roll of film out, you put it back in its little pouch and you went down to Walgreens and you put it in an envelope and then you began a time of intercession 
and fasting and praying because you were gonna send this into you don't know where for at least two weeks. And then you were gonna pray that when it came back, maybe all 24 pictures were not of your shoe. Maybe you took something. I know many of you don't even know what that is because we just take a picture of ourselves and then we edit it and we crop it and we filter it and we send it up there into, and there it is for the whole world. We can't even fathom that this would then go into an envelope and then it would come back and it would go into this thing in a laboratory that is called the dark room. And they would take this roll and they would put it through nine chemical processes through a series of trays where they were waiting for the image to be forged on the negative. Now, as it went through those chemical processes, the big thing that you had to remember was you could never open the dark room door. Because if you opened the dark room door and the light came in, it would expose the film and it would destroy it. So you had to wait till the image was forged through the processes, then you could open the door and then you could bring the image out on this negative and the light wouldn't destroy it because the image was already forged. Why do we do a photography lesson on Saturday night just before we start church? Because what happens in the challenge for our generation, it doesn't matter what our age is, most of us, we have been lulled into thinking that our purpose, our destiny, our pursuit of Christ, our, the fulfilment of the call of God on each one of our lives, whatever that may be, we think it's like a snap and upload, like an Instagram, that we're gonna get a glimpse of it and next week or next minute it's going to happen. But God does not develop our lives like an Instagram upload or a Facebook upload. It's more like a roll of film. God saves us. And then we go through a series of processes where the image of God is forged on the inside of us. And God assures that that image is forged on the inside of us before He then propels us into a world to do what He has called us to do. And some of us are so frustrated and some of us have walked away from the purpose of God because we didn't wanna go through the process. And we opened the door because we can. I don't wanna stay in the process in this church. I don't wanna keep serving in this ministry. It's a bit too hard in this marriage. It's a little bit too hard to stay committed in this job. And we open that dark room door and we step out and we are exposed and the light that is on us is greater than the light that is in us. So it kills us and destroys us. And then we wonder why we don't fulfil our purpose and our destiny. And everything we are doing on the planet today has come out of being submitted in that place and allowing the character of God to be forged on the inside of us through a series of processes to do what God's calling us to do today. Now, what you see on Instagram and Facebook, whoo, A21 and Propel and Christine teaching around the world, and you can be lulled into thinking it was a snap and upload. But God does not do snap and uploads. God develops us. There's always a process. I'm gonna show you that from Scripture tonight. God develops us through a process. You know, we wanna be discovered in our generation. Oh, we wanna get out there and market ourselves and be discovered. God doesn't need to discover you. He created you. He already knows who you are. You don't need to be discovered by God because you've been created by God. But a lot of us are out there marketing ourselves, trying to be discovered and God's saying, I don't need you to be discovered. I need you to be formed and I need you to be transformed into my image so you could do what I put you on the earth to do. And we've got too many of us us running out there trying to be discovered rather than allowing God to develop us. God develops us to take us into our purpose and destiny. And we're going to see in the life of a young man, the process of development that God takes us to. So with that, we're going to go to 1 Samuel 16. The scripture says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. 
And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him for we will not sit down till he comes here, hashtag awkward, that would be interesting. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. I'm just gonna read one more verse there. It says, now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. So verse 13, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forth. Verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. What do you do when the Spirit of the Lord and the anointing comes on you and leaves the person that's over you, but God waits for 20 years and 20 chapters? before He appoints you for what He had anointed you to do. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, the Scripture says, Now all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh in times past when Saul was king over us. It was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel. I want you to hear this. David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah, so that was half of the kingdom, for seven years. So he was 37 years old when it says, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over Israel and Judah for 33 years. So he actually was anointed to be king of Israel at around 17 years old. But he wasn't appointed to 2 Kings chapter 5, 20 chapters of the Bible, 20 years later, when he was 37, that was when he was appointed to be king over both the southern and the northern kingdom, the whole kingdom of Israel. In our generation, we would have told this story really, really differently. But I need you to know that whether it's 2019 and we've got instant technology and connection and internet and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Tinder and every other thing that you could want, that God still builds our purpose and our destiny and our marriages and our families and our lives and our relationships through a process where we being conformed and transformed into His image. The word for that would be called sanctification. There is a process that happens so we become more like Him, which is the goal of our Christianity. It's not just about what we do for Him, but it's who are we becoming in the process. And we're here to become more and more like Jesus. But it doesn't happen overnight. In a generation that wants everything instantly, we live for likes, we live for applause, we live to be invited. God's saying, no, no, no. If you're gonna make it and you're gonna fulfil the purpose I have for you, you're going to have to have a very counter-cultural approach to your purpose and your destiny if you're gonna fulfil it. And so we see here 
that right from the time that Samuel came, the Lord said, I'm done with Saul. Some of you, God's done with certain things in your life. He says, how long are you gonna mourn it? You're on that same hamster wheel and you're mourning over something that God is finished with. And you're staying committed to something that God's saying, you know what? That's done. How long are you gonna mourn? I have chosen for myself a new king. God had moved on and said, we're moving on. So it is fascinating to me that Samuel turns up and eventually David is anointed. I am so glad that David didn't take a hashtag, uh, take a selfie and go, hashtag future King of Israel, (laughs) upload, because he still had 20 years to go. So we think I've got that prophetic word or I've got that sense of calling from God while I was in my quiet time or the Lord spoke to me through someone else and there is, I, you know, I'm gonna be, I know I'm going to be the next worship leader. You would just take the microphone and take us into the Holy of Holies. I mean, you wouldn't go to creative worship rehearsals. What do you mean? Moi? Sign up for the creative team as a backing vocalist? I am the next American Christian Jesus worship idol. (laughs) Why would I go through a process? Don't you know how great my gift is? And what we don't understand is the difference between gift and anointing. A gift will fill a room, a gift will entertain people. But you wonder why people come to church bound and in chains and in shackles and can't break free because Isaiah says it is the anointing that breaks the yoke, not the gift. And so we got a lot of gifted people that have got no power, no anointing, because there has been no development. And developing happens in the dark room. Developing happens, oil comes when there's crushing of grapes or olives. When the crushing happens, that's where the oil comes. The most anointed people are the ones that have been crushed. They've been crushed. So Samuel comes in and what we have to understand even in 2019, because this is the era of you just choose what you wanna do. I don't wanna serve anyone else. I'm not gonna sign up. What do you mean I'm gonna sign up and serve in the parking lot? What do you mean I'm gonna sign up and serve with the kids or do the youth or come and help? What do you mean? It's not my gift. It's not my personality profile. It's not my Enneagram number. It's not where I fit on the disc profile. It's not my love language. And so we profile ourselves out of the will of God. We profile ourselves because we just listen to secular psychology and we'll go, you know, something that maybe is meant to be a guide, we turn into a God. Rather than understanding that God chooses. We've got a generation that just thinks you can choose to do whatever you wanna do. I'm like, really? Where's that in the Bible? If I'm following Jesus, He chooses. I don't get to choose. You know, when they dig up some time machine of our generation, they're gonna dig it up from the ground and they're gonna say, man, those people in 2019, they had really weird sayings. Like the most common saying of 2019 is, you do you boo. (laughs) I'm like, I've got advice for you, church. Don't do you boo. Don't do you boo. We're in a world doing themselves boo and how's that working for us? How's that working for us? God chooses. We see this throughout the text. David didn't choose. He wasn't sitting there playing a harp to the sheep going, oh man, I wanna be king of Israel. Oh man, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be that. I'm gonna do that. And we come to church and we tell God what we're gonna do. (laughs) And that church didn't recognise the gift on my life. So I'm gonna go to the church down the street where they will. And then we wonder why we spend all our time on earth not being processed through to fulfil the thing that God has for us because we think we're just gonna choose whatever we wanna do. But the Bible says that God chose. And I'll tell you why there's so much anxiety and stress when it comes to employment and purpose and calling. Because a whole lot of us are trying to do something that God actually never put us on the earth to do. We would take a whole lot of anxiety out of our lives if we stopped trying to keep up with the Joneses and we started just getting into our lane and doing what God has called us to do. 
You would actually have a lot more peace if you stopped scrolling through everybody else's life and just lived your own life. You would actually have a lot more peace. Many of you, you wouldn't need that extra glass of wine at night because you would just sleep if you just turned your Instagram off. You would just sleep if you stopped looking at Twitter. You would instantly be able to come off some of that medication because you're stressing yourself out through trying to live up to something that was not your calling. It was somebody else's. And we have everyone's calling right here in our faces. Let me just say, if you're not inspired by someone else's life, but you feel like you've got to compete or compare or you feel minimised or it shrinks you, unfollow. It's the greatest gift you can do, unfollow. And don't follow people that are not imitating Christ. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate who? Christ. If you wanna become like Christ, it helps to follow people that are becoming like Christ. And so what we need to do is understand that God chooses. And you know what happened was God had already chosen David, but but Saul didn't know. So he says, we're gonna have a, a festivities party, a sacrifice festivity party. And who was invited? Jesse, his sons, all of them except for David. David was not even invited to his own party. What do you do when you're not invited to your own party? This party was going to be for the future King of Israel. That was gonna be David, but he wasn't invited. But you know what? He was in oblivion because this was before social media. So he was not sitting on the mountain with the sheep, scrolling through hashtag sacrifice festivities. So many of us have so much stress because we're scrolling through a hashtag thinking I'm not invited to that party. I've decided ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. David was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. He was killing a bear, killing a lion. He was looking after the sheep. He was worshipping. He was learning all of the skills privately. How do we know that? Because we see them down the track publicly. Oh, I know that he was faithful in private because when Goliath turned up, he was able to destroy him. I know that he was faithful with his worship music privately because when Saul needed to be soothed, they called David to play the harp. He must have been doing something right in the mountains. What you do privately for the Lord will always be given an opportunity to be manifest publicly. Some of us, we think nobody sees me. I'm on the side of the mountain. If I'm not front and centre, if I'm just down serving at the kids or if I'm just serving in one of the outreach ministries or if I'm working in the parking lot, how will they see me? And God's like, I gotcha. You don't have to worry. Everybody else was invited to this party, but God had chosen David. And if God has assigned you, God will find you. You don't need to market yourself if God has assigned you. We had a generation trying to market themselves. Honey, if you are marked by God, you don't have to be marketed by man. The mark of God will set you apart. And if God has assigned you, God will find you. I've seen it throughout my whole life. Serving out in the back of nowhere in a youth centre. I didn't even know my pastor knew my name. And seven years later, he's like, I want to put you over the state youth movement for our for our denomination. He'd never heard me speak. I didn't even know I could speak at that time to 20,000 kids in an arena. And people are like, whoa, where did she come from? What an overnight success. I'm thinking it was a flipping long night. (laughs) It was a really long night. And a lot of us, we bypass because we're so busy. Are we curating this right? Is this image right? Am I around the right people? Am I using and leveraging people in the right? Our whole society is sick the way it's doing that. And we've transferred that into the kingdom. And God's saying, it's okay. If I anointed you, be faithful, be faithful in that marriage. Be faithful with those children in that season that they're in. Be faithful in your relationships. Be faithful to keep yourself morally pure. Be faithful to serve in church life where I've put you. It's okay. God knows where to find you. God had not overlooked David just because everybody else had. Just because everybody else had. What we discover from this text is that first impressions are not always right. We live in a world obsessed with first impressions. But the Bible says that Samuel came in and he looked at Eliab and thought. Because that's what we do. Oh, ours is the generation. I'll tell you what the fight is for in our generation. It's the fight for our eyes. 
That's why Scripture repeatedly says, fix your eyes on Jesus because we're obsessed with fixing our eyes on everything else. And so we look, and of course, there's no such thing as fake news at all, I know, but the thing is that how many things have been wrong just even in the last few weeks on social media? Oh, we saw that image and we thought. I looked at that and I thought. So much of that, so much damage being done because we look and think. The first impressions don't always count because he looked and he saw the wrong thing. So the prophet was in the right house, but he saw the wrong thing. Jesse didn't even know he had a king in his house. What do you do when the prophet overlooks you and the father of the house overlooks you? See, what a lot of us do is we think, well, I'm gonna leave. And it's so interesting to me that in this one household, both the prophet and the father got it wrong. But you have to trust that God never gets it wrong. God never gets it wrong. That if God has placed you there, God has assigned you and He will come and He will find you. But here we go. Samuel looked because he was looking for the wrong thing. That's what most of us do. We see things and we think because we're looking for the wrong things. Samuel was looking for the next Saul because he saw Eliab and thought, Eliab had the same stature as a Saul. He had the same makeup. If you go on and further read 1 Samuel 17, you'll see a lot of his personality was like Saul's as well. So what you have is Samuel looked at him and thought, ah, there's the next king. But God never said, I'm going to appoint the next king. God said, I'm going to, I have chosen for myself a new king. See, we live in a generation that wants the next and we're missing the new. The next is the same old thing normally in a younger package. It's not the new wineskin. It's not the new thing. The prophet says, behold, I do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? What's happening in this nation and around the church? Well, God's doing a new thing, but most people are missing it because they're looking for the next of the same old thing in a younger body. And God says, oh no, you're not. You're missing this. I'm doing a new thing. What's happening here in Celebration Church? It's not just the same old thing. Behold, I do a new thing. It's a new thing for a new generation in a new age. And God's moving forward. And a lot of people miss the new because they're looking for the next. Some of you are missing the anointed one because you're looking for the gifted one. And God says, oh, no, no, no. The answer, someone's come to church tonight, whether it's in your business or in your sphere of influence, perhaps in your ministry, whatever sphere you're in, and the person that God has for you is right there, but you've missed them because you're looking for the next, whatever that might be. Hollywood has the next. Who's the next young artist? Who's the next? And God's like, I don't do the next. I only do one of everyone. I don't need the next of somebody else. I need the new thing. And the thing that you've been praying for, it's right there under your nose, but you've missed the person because you're looking for a certain gift and you're missing the anointing that God has. And then he says, God doesn't look like man at the outside. God looks at the heart. Listen, this is a hard one for us to grasp because everything is about our curating our external image. I mean, we have so many filters on our phone as if that's not enough, we download apps with more filters. And we just stand there and go, hang on a minute, I need to just take a, a selfie of my most authentic, spontaneous self. Hang on a minute, it's gotta be authentic and spontaneous. Is the lighting right? H have you got the angle right? Uh, let me look at that. I, no, no, don't upload that. that. That's our era. And it's just another form of religious piety. Man, is my external, am I, am I just turning up to church and everyone thinks I've got it together? And God says, man, I don't need social media to see beyond the external. I've never looked at the external. You've been playing that game with me for years, church. You turn up, have your church face on, and then you go and live like hell the rest of the week. Um, you might be fooling your parents and your friends and your coworkers, but you never fooled God, just in case you were wondering. It's God. And He says, oh, I'm not fooled. God does not get up every morning and look through your Instagram profile to see how you are. He's not like, oh, can you check their Facebook status? Because I'm not sure how they're doing today. Now the world does that, so we wanna put our best self out there or our worst self, whichever gets you the most attention normally. But that's another sermon, so I'm gonna move over to this side of the room. 
And so what we do is we think God's checking and He goes, no, no, I'm looking at your heart. That's why Proverbs says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flow what? All of the issues of life, everything. Everything in your life stems back to the condition of your heart. How's your heart tonight? Is it toxic? Is it full of bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, shame, guilt, condemnation, lust, greed, envy, guile? Because the external manifestations of your behaviours are stemming, and mine, are stemming from the condition of our heart. That's why Proverbs says, guard it, garrison it. If you put as much time into your heart as you do on your Instagram profile, if you curated the condition of your spiritual heart with the same meticulous attention that we curate to our public profile, I'm telling you, we would change the world because the Spirit of the Lord would flow through us and we'd stop trying to act like Christians. We'd just be Christians. We'd just be Christians. For the sake of time, let me move on. We see from the text that there is no overnight success. When, when God began to develop David, he was the nobody that nobody noticed. You might feel today in this room like you're the nobody that nobody notices. That was me. I'm the kid that was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted. I'm the kid that was sexually abused for 12 years. I'm the, the immigrant kid that grew up in the poorest zip code in my state. When I walked into a church service like this exactly 30 years and three weeks ago on a night just like tonight, the last Sunday night in January, 1989, I was a mess. I was the nobody that nobody would have noticed. You could be in this room tonight sitting in the back row, couldn't keep it together for 10 seconds. I was so messed up. That's normally what happens if you've been abused for 12 years and abandoned and rejected. Like David, I was the nobody that nobody noticed, but I was the kid sitting in the back still full of potential. There was a global anti-trafficking organisation in me. There was a global women's encouragement, development movement on the inside of me. There was global TV and books but you wouldn't have noticed because I was such a mess. But God did. But there was no snap and upload. It's like, I'm gonna take you through a process and Chris, the degree to which you're willing to go through those processes and allow my image to be forged on the inside of you is the degree to which I'm gonna be able to use you. Because Chris, there's gonna be a lot of spotlights on you. And so the image of me better be bright on the inside of you or that light will destroy you. And if you wanna get, you don't wanna get to a place that your character cannot keep you. You wanna get to a place where the image of God on the inside of you is, it'll keep you, it'll keep you in your marriage. It'll keep you parenting your kids. It'll keep you faithful in your relationships. It'll keep you morally pure when you're not married. It'll keep you being faithful to Jesus because His character's on the inside of you. Some of you are struggling so much with fidelity to Christ because you haven't allowed His character to be forged on the inside of you. You've gotten out there and you can't make it for two straight days. God's saying, hey, let me do the process in you. We're in process of becoming, not discovering. Our world is all about discovery and evolving. That's not Christianity. It's a process of becoming like Christ. Becoming like Christ. And there are no overnight successes. You have to know that. There are no overnight successes. You know, unless you are prepared to go through a process, your marriage isn't gonna be all that it can be. Parenting isn't gonna be all that it can be. Your destiny, your job, look at any sphere of life. But we have grown up and we're gonna continue to, it's not going away, so it's important that we talk about this stuff. Many of us think in the Christian Kingdom of God that it operates according to the way that the world operates, but we're not citizens of this earth. We're residents here, but we're citizens of heaven if we've been born again. So we operate according to a whole different system. God says, I don't do it like the world. I don't need to snap and upload. I don't need to discover you. I created you. Now allow my image to be forged on the inside of you. So many of you have been grappling with low self-esteem, grappling with anxiety, grappling with depression, grappling with a whole lot of stress going, God, how's it all gonna happen? How's my purpose gonna happen? And you're scrolling through everyone else's life. You're going, look at what they're doing and look at what they're doing. And I feel like a loser. And then addictions start and patterns of destructive behaviours start because you fixed your eyes on the wrong thing. God says, I'm not looking. 
looking at the outside. I'm looking at your heart. All I've ever wanted is for you to give me your heart. And if you give me your heart, I will work with your heart and I'll propel you to your destiny. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. I hope you'll share your thoughts in the comments and if you feel led, please share this video with a friend who needs to see it. Thanks so much for watching.